we're introducing a new series called What Makes Marriages Work. These episodes focus on qualities and behaviors in relationships that make them last and so much more rewarding. Dr. Scoresby talks about everything from communication to partnership skills to common but avoidable marriage traps. Best of all, these tips can be applied to any relationship to make it better and taught to your children so they can have healthy relationships. Welcome to Do What Matters Most. This is the first episode in the series, What Makes Marriages Work. Many people don't know what makes a quality relationship anymore, let alone how to create and maintain one. Dr. Scoresby presents 15 qualities that make a relationship last and make it rewarding along the way. He also discusses what research says are the five make or break factors in relationship success and satisfaction. And these can apply to marriage, family, and work relationships. Visit mattersmostmedia.org to find more about the podcast and firstanswers.com to find tons of relationship resources. There are many indications in our society that in the last two or three decades, many people appear to not have good ideas about what makes a quality relationship. And therefore, many individuals are failing to achieve success they hope for and probably deserve. The problem is larger than a failing marriage or two. It can be a problem for our children. When one generation fails to pass along its wisdom about what makes relationships successful, then the coming generation is put in a situation where trial and error is the only option. And we know that's limited. There appears to be many whose trials become errors, and then they respond by being much more frightened about committing to a long-term relationship like marriage, or even participating in friendships, if that has some expectations attached to it. A few years ago, a youth group asked me as an older adult to provide them a list of things I did while dating. The subtitle was to provide a description of how a boy could treat a girl and really impress her. I sent over several items on the list, and their response was most interesting. They wanted to know where I had come up with such revolutionary ideas. The purpose of this lesson is to identify the very most important ingredients of a fabulous relationship. I believe that if we're going to talk about a good relationship, we just as well make it fabulous. My goal is to provide you with descriptions of what you might do to improve your relationship and provide examples of what everyone can do to make their relationships more satisfying. There are more than five ingredients, of course, but if you are interested in improving your marriage, your friendship, work or family relationship, it is best to focus on a few at a time. I'm going to describe 15 qualities which have been identified as those which make a relationship last and rewarding for people who participate in them. I will also describe the opposite of each quality and some of the consequences when we do it right. At the end of this lesson, I will identify what research indicates are the five make-or-break factors in relationship success and satisfaction. I intend to apply these qualities to marriage, family, and work relationships. Therefore, there will be some qualities I don't mention because they don't apply to all relationship situations. For example, I will not give focus to the qualities that create a passionate sexual relationship because that hopefully only applies to the one relationship where marital romance is involved. As you listen, if you wish, measure the success of each quality as it applies to you. Rate it from 1 to 5, 5 being the most successful and you are the most satisfied with yourself. This will give you an idea of where you might start to improve or strengthen your current relationship. At the end, identify what you think will be the five most crucial qualities and then compare your answers with what this research suggests to us. There is no implied priority to the order in which I present these relationship qualities. Those I present at first should not be considered as the most important just because they are presented first. So, what are the most important ingredients of a fabulous relationship? You might think the answer to that question is whatever the two people decide is most important. As it turns out, there is some modest truth to that idea, but the most crucial idea for this lesson is that all very good relationships appear to have most qualities in common, and this means that when we learn about them, we can improve them and find greater health and happiness in our own experiences. I'm going to begin with number one, which is trust versus mistrust, because in most relationships, the feeling link between two or more people is sufficiently sensitive that any difficulty, betrayal, or distress will be felt by others who are close to them. 
At first, a partner, for example, might not know what is causing the problem, but they still feel it, and this begins to separate them. Trust is a tie that binds us together, and when it exists, and safety and security exists, then it does not become fear that disillusions us. If you are measuring your own relationship and rate it, how much trust you feel and believe exists in your relationship with someone? Five, I remind you, begins to show that there is a great deal of trust, and one means there is very little. Somewhere along this dimension, you will be able to determine what now exists. Trust versus mistrust is an essential quality of a relationship because trust, as I mentioned, creates safety and security, which is the primary emotional climate for love and commitment. When there is trust, there is also more love, there is also more commitment, and there is more openness, which typically creates more satisfaction in the, in the relationship. What is trust? Well, trust is predictability, and that each person can predict that the other person will act benevolently. Sometimes in a marriage, for example, we might trust each other, but when there's discord or a, a difficult decision and anger erupts, then mean words are said. That creates fear and it creates some mistrust. So when there isn't trust, there is fear. And when this exists, people tend to close down rather than open themselves to one another. Now, if you wish to improve this area of trust, try honesty. Try keeping promises. Try communicating more frequently. Sometimes you may think it's acceptable to say a little white lie in order to preserve someone's feelings. Well, it might be. But if you continue that as a habit and fudge a little on the truth or make something up in order to avoid something you're embarrassed about, it, it often will come out and then trust may suffer if you do. Instead, learn a way of telling the truth that doesn't hurt anybody. Start every day with a commitment to be very honest in words and in your actions. When you agree to make a promise, make keeping it a value you honor. Communicating more frequently reduces anxiety and makes it possible for people to feel safe. Also consider doing something for the other person without expecting anything in return. When you do this, you can build trust because your actions suggest caring instead of some less favorable motive. Number two, it's called cognitive flexibility versus cognitive rigidity. Cognitive flexibility is the ability to understand more than one perspective so that when you're voicing an opinion, you can tell your own, but you also become aware that you can communicate about another person's or another alternative point of view. Cognitive flexibility provides options for people when they communicate and relate to each other. It grants a sense of freedom, so it makes us feel free when we're talking and when we're in this relationship with somebody. Please remember that freedom is love's aphrodisiac, Freedom enables people to feel more love, to receive more love, and anything that reduces this freedom may restrict it. Cognitive rigidity shows up when one individual thinks his or her opinion is the only one and the only correct one, and that anybody who has a difference of opinion, by definition, then is wrong. When a person is rigid, real rigid, there is a tendency to be more blame, more criticism, and more condemnation when somebody has a difference of opinion. There's also more anger because a person who is rigid, really rigid, tends to be angry and resentful when somebody differs. But there are two problems here. It will be important for you to have an opinion and express it honestly, but it is also crucial for you to be tentative when you voice yours and indicate it is how you see or think as your point of view, rather than stating something that is you believe to be always right and never wrong. Also indicate that you are aware that there are other opinions too, and those who are important to the person who has them. Ask for them, listen to them, and understand them. Being flexible doesn't mean that you become passive or you become willy-nilly and don't have any opinion of your own. Flexibility means you have your opinion, you understand it, you feel confident in it, but you also like to consider other perspectives. Being able to do this is a major strength in your uh, marriage, in your workplace relationships, and in your uh, friendships. This is not a problem of any specific gender. Women and men can be cognitively rigid. This often happens because uh, they're taught to be that way by uh, inherited anxiety or uh, they've been around someone like a parent who is real rigid like this. 
Imagine working in a situation where your supervisor or a co-worker, for example, has opinions and believe these are the opinions that matter most and they're the only ones that matter and they don't care about yours. What is your feeling? What is your thoughts about that? It tends to make you feel like you're not unimportant and that you're not valued. So it is possible for any individual to make themselves more flexible by learning more, by learning to be tentative, and by learning to ask and listen for other people's points of view. Number three. Number three may surprise you. It's called the orientation toward time. Time, as it turns out, is one of the least studied variables in all of human behavior, and it is also uh, one that influences us the most. Here's where it influences our relationships. Some people, for example, are very future-oriented, where they're making plans today for things that they want to have happen in the future. So they'll establish goals. They will work about uh, work the amount of strategy to achieve them. And then when it comes time to formulate a strategy, they will th- think about all the things they're doing of uh, today that's going to end up in the positive conditions they've imagined. Other individuals, for example, are more present-oriented, and they want to do things right at the moment. So they're much more interested in spontaneity or openness and uh, so on. Now, it turns out to be really important to be like that some of the time. But then there are also individuals who get trapped in their past. Sometimes it's a bad past. So if in a relationship you have some history of unhappiness, Quite often, the unhappiness motivates the two people to get into a conversation that's in the past. You did this, you didn't do that, and uh, so on. And they begin to hold an argument, have a, a frustration, and so they might say, well, let's just not talk about that topic. Well, not talking about something is the same thing as saying, let's just wait a while and then it'll show up again. So the orientation toward time turns out to be really crucial and, it, and we can have all three. There's good sentiments and happy memories from the past. There's the benefit of being able to be present, think about current events, think about what's going on between you and the other person, and also taking a look between the present and the future. The important point is that we learn to put ourselves in each time the same time for both of us. So if we're, I'm having a conversation about my memories, Then you listen and then uh, take a turn and tell about yours. When we're having conflict in the past, however, it is important to stop that and say, I would just like to talk about what you want. I'd like to talk about what I want and let's see if we can achieve that. Here's how it works. When couples can both be in the same time, when one focuses on the past and the other considers the present or the future, It needs to be adjusted or your communication will just fly by and won't connect. You can correct this by suggesting that you wish to the person you're talking with to talk about either the past, present, or the future. It may sound a little stranger to begin with, but when you get involved with something like this and the matter is really crucial, you want to make sure that you and the other person are talking in the same time. Now remember something really important about time. When there's a challenge to a relationship and you're worried about whether or not it'll succeed, you should remember that faith and hope about relationships always lie between the present and the future. So you want to make sure that you're optimistic and hopeful about the relationship and your efforts to improve it. Number four. Number four is communicational accuracy. This simply means that you know how to send your messages accurately and correctly receive what someone else sends to you. The opposite of that is to be a poor listener or to have an agenda of your own and start making up something while the other person is speaking so that you don't listen. This disregard for what you say or what the other person says or what you hear makes it difficult to become clear about what you want, what's important to you, how you feel, correction of any behavior or changes, and so on. You can correct this by beginning to working hard to listen much better. Learn to do something called checking it out. Can I check this out when you talk? Can I make sure that I understand to see if you can understand the other person? You can also ask more open-ended questions like, I would like to know, and can you tell me about, and then summarize what the other person says, and do so without agreeing or disagreeing. 
See if you can identify what the other person is feeling as he or she talks. Pay attention and listen well. When feelings are intense, that is the time to accelerate your willingness to listen. And this is because you might be hearing something that you don't agree with, or you might be hearing something that's just a little negative about yourself. So your motive to answer quickly and to explain may be so great that you fail to understand the other person's message. It is just a really good practice to learn that when things get more intense, to slow yourself down, ask more questions, listen carefully, and make sure that you understand the other person's meaning. Creating communicational accuracy goes a long way to creating a fabulous relationship. Number five is creating some of the emotional rewards that you feel. Quite often in a relationship, we stay in it because we have the idea that the other person makes us feel good or that the relationship is so rewarding made by the other person that uh, that's why we stay in it, want to spend time with each other. But instead of that, what actually happens is that at least half of what you feel, especially the good feelings, is created by your own actions. So the idea is that you learn to cause some of the feelings that you want yourself instead of depend wholly on what the other person does. One of the biggest disadvantages to any relationship is when you have a set of expectations for how the other person will treat you so you can feel the feelings you want. Then when that other person doesn't understand your expectations or comply with them, then you might get frustrated. You might say to them, why don't you or wish you would or something like that. And that triggers a, a sort of dialogue where uh, you're communicating that the other person is not being competent where you're concerned. So what you do instead is to do something positive, like expressing more gratitude for the other person and to express more kindness and love and affection, or at least commitment. Then you identify your feelings to see if you can be happier. Now, if you actually were more kind and uh, did something significant to support the other person and you felt happier, uh, who caused it? Well, you did. And the point is that you should learn that you can cause positive or good feelings. It makes you less dependent and it gives you more latitude and opportunity to function well in a relationship. I'll give you an example about two friends who, when they went shopping one day, got into a little teeny tiff because uh, they had a disagreement about some article of clothing. There was only one and both wanted it. And so they had a little bit of a challenge. The, they both left and the other person was saying, well, I, I have uh, uh, upset feelings about what she did. But one finally decided that I'm going to do something to uh, communicate to her I like her. And she sent over a little teeny gift and said to her friend, I love you and everything's going to be okay. Then uh, she felt better about doing that and realized that she had felt better and her friend hadn't done anything. So uh, she learned that she could, in fact, cause positive feelings through her own actions. Learning to cause something positive every day in your marriage and every time you communicate with a friend or a co-worker makes a great deal of difference in terms of how you feel about the relationship. It is a very high caliber form of behavior. Number six. Managing conflict constructively versus responding to the mistakes or errors another person makes by criticizing him or her and then arguing about them. In an ongoing relationship, if there is conflict, it can become a habit. And there are three kinds of conflict, actually. You may think there's many kind, and you may think it's the topic you're talking about. A lot of married couples think, for example, the biggest cause of conflict in their marriage is money or sex. It's not true. The biggest cause of conflict is that they don't have a good partnership that allows them to resolve problems or differences of opinion. So the types of conflict that occur actually dictate the kind of how you manage it. So I'm going to briefly describe all three, and then you can see what I mean. One is where there is too much control, where one person lectures and talks more than the other, criticizing and condemning, giving instructions, sermonizing, and saying this is what you should do. Another form of conflict is to uh, compete excessively, where you accelerate the competition and escalate 
you know, the anger. I can say something mean about you. You top that by saying something mean about me. And the conflict uh, increases until there's true unhappiness and misery. The third kind, of course, is more familiar to us. And that is just a simple difference of opinion where one person thinks he's right and the other's wrong. Or one person wants to win and can't stand to lose in a, in a discussion. All three types of conflict may require a coach or a therapist. But the solution usually is recognizing that you have a communication problem that needs to be solved rather than the other person's personality being ineffective or negative. I repeat that. Most conflict is a result of the style of transmission or communication, not about the bad behavior of the other person. If both speak without blaming and listen carefully to the other, the solution to conflict typically will emerge. Number seven is also really interesting and it may seem unusual. This quality is the ability to receive love, to receive warmth, and to receive affection. Some people have real difficulty with that. Some people feel like that obligates them or that they don't know how to handle it or manage it or receive it. And the opposite of this, of course, is the idea that a relationship can be perpetuated by distance, withdrawal, and rejection. So instead of showing or receiving love, what happens is that a person removes himself or herself and uh, doesn't communicate. The hurtiest tears I've ever seen cried by anyone or it was cried by a woman whose husband would sometimes just not talk to her. And in my clinical office, I asked her how long a period of time that was, and she said about three months. Well, when a person withdraws from the other person, like a friend withdraws from a friend, or a co-worker withdraws from a co-worker, the person who's withdrawn from tends to believe that that's rejection, and rejection really hurts. And so withdraw because I want to be safe, might be rejection of the other person. And the consequence of this is that the feelings of love do not last, and or friendship, or just good commitment to a relationship. And, and what replaces that are these periods of time where we don't have problems, and or when we do have problems and argue over them. So it, it is often the case that people in relationships believe that success is the absence of problems. Not true. The success of a fabulous relationship is when there's abundant love and happiness and warmth and fun and enjoyment and the right kind of affection. Try solving this by communicating more affection and warmth each day. Express more appreciation and gratitude for what the other person does. Pay compliments wisely. And if there is an intense discussion, do not leave the conversation unless you promise to return later and talk about it. Develop a talking routine that enables both of you to develop the ethic of talking things out, of actually allowing you to say, we're going to solve this by talking and listening. Number eight, leadership and positive character qualities. You may wonder why leadership is an important ingredient for a fabulous relationship. But the simple truth is that Really good relationships have growth attached to them, and the idea of growth and maturation of a relationship means that we're going to some place that we've never been, that the relationship gets better and better over time. Most happy older couples, for example, will tell us that the form of love they have for each other later on is much greater than the type of love they had for each other on the day they married. That's true for friendship. It's true for co-worker relationships. I know, for example, in some executive teams, it takes a year or two or three to build the high-quality teamwork where the team members are so loyal to each other, they start offering each other individual resources like, do you want to borrow my lawnmower or do you want to have my daughter tend your kids when you go out, something like that. Well, that form of leadership means that a person... Uh, who supplies leadership, doesn't have to be more right or more visionary and so on. But it does mean that we develop the personal qualities that motivate people to listen to or, or pay attention to us. The opposite of leadership and positive character qualities, of course, are thoughtlessness, shady behavior such as manipulation and demanding uh, something from the other person. 
The consequence of lack of leadership and positive character qualities is a devitalized relationship and passivity when action is required. It'll be like the two of you have a hard time getting together and working well together. This leadership is not about power and control. It's about creating unity. A man or a woman who wishes to exercise leadership in their marriage will say, I would like us to come together. I want us to find a way to consider what's important to you and what's important to me, and then let's join that so that we're unified. Leadership in creating unity comes about by talking about things you hope for and invite your partner to do the same and then create a common strategy to achieve it. I repeat, positive character traits turn out to be a, a wonderful part of a fabulous relationship because it it makes us trust and have the ability to rely on one another. Nine, acquire a strong sense of individuality. Some people are afraid of individuality or voicing an opinion or being assertive, thinking that it will cause conflict or difficulty with the other person. That's true only if the way a person expresses their individuality is aggressive or indifferent to the other person. Instead of, of thinking that individuality is a problem, just imagine that the best form of love and happiness in a marriage is when there are two capable individuals who have their own opinions and their own ideas, plus they learn how to join them in a way that satisfies both. They discover that the joining of them is what creates the satisfaction in the marriage. So it's easy for us typically to create this. One person can, for example, learn to express his or her thoughts and just say, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm feeling, this is what I want, this is what I hope for. Do it in a soft way so that the word I is not a hard, aggressive I, I want. But do it in a soft way saying, this is what matters to me and I'd really appreciate it if it was considered. Then if you do so as an individual, then you can recognize the individuality of another person. One of the significant problems in marriage, for example, is when a couple fails to achieve a good balance between the individual needs and hopes of one person and the needs to maintain the relationship. There's too much togetherness, it's a problem. If there's too much individualness, it's a problem. Number 10 is the method used to rid anger and eliminate its role in the relationship. Some people have a theory a false theory, in my opinion, that the best way to get ang rid of anger is to express it and to express it and point out why the other person makes you angry or upset. In my experience, what that does is uh, give one person a chance to sort of bludgeon the other. In a fabulous or a really healthy relationship, they have a, a couple's uh, friends or couples or co-workers have a joint way of understanding that anger may exist but they help each other resolve it. So, for example, instead of my anger or frustration being expressed by condemning you, uh, I might tell you about my anger, and we might talk a little bit about it, and we might work with it a little bit until I've had a chance to express it without condemning you, but feeling like you could understand the reason why I do. When the relationship is not a good one or fabulous, then anger is more common and expressed in more hurtful, damaging ways. So what happens is that if you want to improve this quality of your relationship, say a marriage, you have to begin by owning the fact that your anger is sometimes a choice, that your anger is responsible for, to you, and that you need to have some way to resolve it, and you may need some help. That's in contrast to justifying it by always saying, I am angry because of what you do or what you've done. I've seen married couples, for example, in situations where one person could legitimately claim uh, to have justifiable anger and decided not to because the anger didn't produce anything that was positive. There are other emotions that are associated with anger, like fear or sadness or distress, and quite often, it is useful to resolve anger by going to those and talking about them. Betrayal, for example, is a common relationship event in some way or another, and it would be useful to help eliminate anger if you could talk about, I feel betrayed, or I feel like I'm not 
listened to or, or understood or even seen. And then when you begin to talk about that, the feelings slow down and diminish because the other person is understanding. Good relationships have a, an anger resolving method that works for both of them. 11. Staying in tune with each other, recognizing feelings, being perceptive, and showing interest versus time away, uh, activities which prevent mutual attention, patterns of disregard, and failure to communicate frequently. Now, I know that distance characterizes some people's relationships, but distance also impacts the ability for people to enjoy it and to find satisfaction with it. Over the years, for example, I have dealt with individuals who say I've traveled on a regular basis, like a, a pilot, and the pilot will be on three days and off four days, and the couple develops really an interesting pattern. When, uh, if it's the pilot is the husband, he'll come home and he'll have expectations for being together, maybe even being intimate. And she, unless she works outside the home, will have organized things, managing the children, everything, and quite often may see him as some kind of an intruder on the system she's created. So they have to learn how to manage the fact that he goes and comes. Well, there's another situation where the couple spend a great deal of time away working long hours, traveling uh, uh, for long periods of time, and they need to set up some kind of a system that accommodates that. The consequence of failing to do this means a learned form of separation and loneliness that we try to adjust to. The solution is to come up with a, a distance managing strategy so that we have a coming home and a leaving ritual. We have a way of talking quickly as soon as we are reunited. We might also, while we're there, to set up regular times for debriefing and explaining the value of the other person's companionship. Just why is being in a relationship where there's this much separation is worth it? Why is it worth it? And you need to identify that so that you don't let the separation ruin what could be a real positive relationship condition. Number 12, emotional honesty. You might have heard lately about the idea of vulnerability and openness, avoiding defensiveness, and learning to be emotionally intimate with one another. This is because when a person's emotionally honest and reaches inside themselves and said, these are things I'm thinking, if it's done without blame and accusation, it's viewed as a significant sign of commitment to a relationship. Hiding feelings, failing to appreciate the role of emotions, the failure to understand them, and the failure to communicate them well is often seen as an indication that the relationship is not of high value. Emotional honesty builds and supports and creates safety if there is no blame. One of the strange ironies of, of a marital relationship is this. If a person, a spouse, has an affair with a third party and is honest about it, comes forward and confesses and says, this is what I'm doing, as compared to a person who has an affair and is caught, which of those two relationships are likely to persist? The amazing thing is, is that the behavior is the same. One person betrayed the other. But the person who is honest about it is likely to affect the idea that the relationship should last because that honesty is perceived by the offended partner as a willingness to try to correct and make things better. Instead of living with a suspicion, increased waiting and failure to act, Learn the names of positive emotions like love and happiness and warmth and gladness and cheerfulness and grad, uh, uh, gratitude and talk about what they mean to you. Define them with the person you're in relationship and then indicate that you're going to use them when you want to talk about it. I want to talk about gratitude. I want to talk about love. I want to talk about my frustration. And here's what it means. You'll find out that being emotionally honest creates a real positive condition in your relationship, whether you're a worker at home. 13. 13 is developing a valid theory of relationship success. This may seem like a little bit complex, but here's the point. Gradually over time, when we participate in relationships, we develop a theory of what makes them successful. And some of us have a theory that actually works and creates successful relationships, and some of us have a theory that doesn't work. 
I remember a man telling me, and he was proposing his fifth marriage, and I asked him what he thought could be the problem, and he said, my problem is mate selection. It's who I select to mate, and I nearly laughed out loud, and I said, well, could you consider then that there's something wrong with you that indicates that you have a selection process? Why select this person? He still thought it always was the women that he had married and not him, which tells us a little bit about him. But when you have a valid theory of relationship success, you will be able to take the best parts of your previous relationships and incorporate them in any new one. You'll be able to move positively and help actively create and generate these circumstances. It's like if you want to pay attention, you will. If you want to show affection, it'll be the right kind. If you need to slow down and and take some time and deliberate, you can do that. The point is that you'll be applying this theory of uh, relationship success. So the consequence of not having one is that you're not sure exactly what to do in a lot of situations that occur. You may be slow to improve. You may be slow to enjoy. And you may react to what others do instead of communicate and feel like your desires are being addressed. So here's what you can do. Read about and ask others when they believe a good relationship exists and then begin to select what you hope for and begin to create it. Now think about that for a minute. There are a lot of good things good fathers do, good mothers do, good husbands do, good wives do, good friends, good co-workers. What are they? Identify what those are and begin to practice them. It's easier than you think and it will enable you to have more enjoyment than what you currently do if you don't have such a theory. 14. Learn to express optimism and humor rather than pessimism and negative thoughts. Optimism and humor are often engagement strategies that allow the other person to listen to you and think, well, I want to be with that individual. Optimism gives people encouragement, a forward look, and hope. Pessimism, in contrast, is typically fear-based, where a person worries about the future, is unable to find enjoyment. A pessimistic person, for example, might set a goal of having a, looking forward to a great vacation and then not doing much of anything to help generate enjoyment, thinking that they'll have fun later on during the vacation. Not so. If you do that, you fail to participate in creating satisfaction along the way. We've learned over the years that being optimistic and generating constructive alternatives to pessimistic thoughts can change a marriage relationship that is looking toward divorce to one that is constructive. It can rehab a friendship that has a momentary break in it. And it can also find a way in some work situations to create some positive alternative to a struggle or a challenge co-workers have or the leaders have with those who follow. It's easy to learn. Where humor is concerned, you might need to collect information about what it is and what kind of humor you possess. But I promise you, expanding your capacity to enjoy good humor is a fun way to help create a fabulous relationship. Now, last and 15, it's called affiliative support. It's about heartfelt communication, displays of support, information, shared information, ideas about things we can do going forward. It's about esteem. It is about The idea that I am benevolent toward you, care about what happens to you, enjoys your success, hopefully as much as you do, and that I can temporarily suspend my needs in order to communicate support for you. When we get used to communicating warmth and attention and respect, the outcome of our relationship is very different. I sometimes will ask people who are in relationship trouble what it is they do, how they see themselves. And they might talk about being more of this or less of that or so on. And quite often, they don't mention anything about behavior that communicates support. I once uh, spent time with a man who talked about how he and his brother, who had had a significant conflict at the time uh, their father passed away, and they argued over their inheritance. And for 25 years, they hadn't spoken to each other. So this man said, I now have been diagnosed with cancer and I'd like to call my brother and communicate with him, but I don't want it to be just because I have this this disease. 
So I said to him, I think you could solve that with one telephone call. And he wanted to know what I meant. And I said, why don't you make a telephone call to your brother? And after saying hello, inquire of him. Find out some things that are going on in his life and communicate that you have an interest and then tell him you'd very much like to get together. So he did that. And the brother, as it turns out, was on the plane the very next day and they were reunited and had a few months to enjoy their relationship before the first man passed away. I don't know why it is that some people do not actually practice affiliative support and make it a part of their life, but many don't. And many don't realize that the absence of that is what causes a lot of difficulty in their marriage and other relationships. It's easy to do, and it makes things a lot more fun. I know that I've covered a lot of ground, so I'm going to review briefly so that you have a chance to rethink these and maybe assess uh, where you can improve in your lives. First was trust versus mistrust, an important quality. Cognitive flexibility versus cognitive rigidity. Number three was the orientation toward time. When you talk, make sure you're in the same time as the other person. Number four, learn to communicate accurately. Learn to listen better. Pay attention to uh, what you say and make it clear. Five, create some emotional rewards yourself so that you learn to assume some responsibility for your happiness because there will be times when your partner or your friend simply can't do that. Six, to manage conflict constructively rather than let it get out of hand and blame and criticize and then argue. Conflict uh, has a basis and be easily resolved if you develop a shared conflict management system. Showing and receiving love, warmth, and affection. Some people have a hard time showing enough or receiving enough. All of us can accelerate that if we pay attention to the idea that there are probably 300 ways to express love, we might do just a few, and it's important for us every day to get better at it. Eight, leadership and positive character qualities. Leaders are people who hope to be leaders, understand that if anybody wants to respect their leadership, they do so because of the character qualities of the leader, and that is true for a husband or a wife. Leadership and positive character qualities are what produces unity, and it's unity that allows people to succeed in their relationships. Number nine is to acquire a strong sense of individuality. Form opinions. Learn to talk about them often without being aggressive. Pay attention to the individual needs of the other person and recognize two individuals as individual people with different needs, hopes, and dreams and learn to benefit from the association. Ten, managing anger instead of justifying it. People who are happiest in their relationships accept the role of anger, but they also accept the role that they don't need to blame or condemn when they're angry, and what they need to do is diminish it through some cooperative effort. 11. Stay in tune with each other. Recognize feelings, being perceptive, showing interest, and listen versus the distance part of a relationship. 12. Emotional honesty which leads to vulnerability and openness, so there's a risk. But if you take the risk under the right condition, it adds a tremendous reward to a high-quality relationship. 13. Develop a valid theory of relationship success by collecting all of your experiences, talking to other people, reading books, and identify qualities or experiences that make relationships succeed. It's easy to do that, and when you know what to do, you're just more effective and successful in relationships with other people. 14. Optimism and humor. Learn to be optimistic. Say optimistic things like, well, today didn't work out well, but if I keep going, it'll probably turn out just fine. Or, I haven't had good experiences, but I hope to. And learn to laugh just a little bit about yourself and to laugh with the other person rather than at them. Optimism and humor are like the oil that supply the uh, movement of a relationship toward improvement. 15. Learn to display affiliative support. Affiliative support are all those forms of behavior that say, I care, you matter, I'm interested in you, I'm paying attention to and remembering you, and I want you to know that I'm supportive here. Now, Have you identified what you think will be the five most crucial elements of a fabulous relationship? 
Now, there are some differences of opinion, but I can tell you after a search of research that it's clear that scientists have discovered that there are a few that are more crucial than the others. Here they are. Trust is one. Did you get that one? Cognitive flexibility is one. Did you choose that one? Having a valid theory of a good relationship is another. Getting rid of anger instead of allowing it to multiply is the fourth one, and affiliative support is the fifth one. All of these are considered the five most important ingredients of a fabulous relationship. I hope you have them, and if you don't, I hope you will do something to improve your relationship so that you do have them. I want you to be successful with all the foregoing, because then your relationships will be healthier and happier. Thank you for listening to this episode of Do What Matters Most, which is sponsored by FirstAnswers.com, where you can find new tools for families and parents of 21st century kids with a focus on emotional self-reliance. Visit FirstAnswers.com to sign up for a free newsletter. Find Do What Matters Most on Facebook and our website, MattersMostMedia.org, where you can ask Dr. Scoresby your own questions. Remember to subscribe to stay up to date with new episodes. Give us a rating and write a review on the podcast app or Google Podcasts and let us know what you think about Do What Matters Most.